Great. Good afternoon and welcome to our Timony webinar this week on navigating a healthy road to recovery. My name is Ronan O'Farrell and I'm the CEO of Timony Leadership Institute, a not-for-profit dedicated to supporting leaders. This day and this week in Timony Advanced Leadership Program, our group of leaders usually are heading out to Dublin Airport uh, to catch a flight to Seville to participate in our, our May module in, uh, in San Telmo Business School. It's a memorable week um, every year as the, the trust and friendship that, uh, that uh, reaches new levels between the leaders participating on the program. And anyone who's been on it will, will know what I'm talking about. Um, this morning, the flight reminder popped up on my computer telling me my flight was about to leave. Sadly, it's a cancelled flight. Uh, it's not going to happen this year. As, uh, as every aspect of the trip, actually, from flights, hotels, coaches, restaurants, the classroom sessions with the faculty, the teamwork, all of it is effectively under siege from, from this, uh, this virus. This week, thankfully, sees the Irish government uh, launching the first phase of opening up, uh, focused primarily, as we know, on, on outside work, and more phases are on the way, though we're reminded that that's how, depends on how well we, we behave. And uh, here to discuss with me the details of how we might navigate in a, in a healthy way, our way back to recovery and to operating, I'm rejoined by Professor Karen Redmond, uh, one of our alumni from the 2019 Advanced Leadership Programme. Karen is a, a consultant thoracic and lung transplant surgeon at the Matter Hospital, where she specializes in surgical management of patients with lung cancer and end-stage lung disease. And she herself has been navigating through this whole pandemic, managing the risk for herself and, and her team, and uh, continuing to deliver a, a service in a very, I'm um, probably can safe to say, highly risky environment of, uh, of a hospital. And uh, in that sense, you're, you're really well placed, uh, Karen, to, uh, to advise us today. If you have questions during the, the course of the, the webinar, please do put them in the, in the question and answer box uh, here on Zoom, write them up there, and we'll, we'll uh, hopefully reach them in the latter half of the, uh, the webinar. So many thanks, Karen, for joining us again. When we spoke um, on our webinar last in early April, we were all bracing ourselves for, for a larger number of fatalities which thank God and thanks to, to everyone's collective effort and, and your own, we've, we've avoided that tsunami so far. Sadly, over, over 1,500 have passed away as a result of the pandemic. And there's some, we've all heard some really heartbreaking situations too for, for family members who, who haven't been able to say goodbye or have the opportunity for, for a proper funeral. So our, our heart goes out to them. But overall, Karen, what's your assessment on how we've done in responding uh, to this hopefully once in a lifetime pandemic? It's been a very difficult time for people and, and we've uh, you know, today been affected. I'm, I'm sorry for that, but um, if you look at it, the 1500 deaths, uh, we've done really well because the estimate initially from the government was about 12 and a half thousand. So mm. by just implementing um, what have been very strict but nonetheless fundamental measures we've reduced the mortality rate by about 11,000 people and that mm. that's the initial issue that we had was was how we're going to cope with the surge of COVID patients coming at us when we didn't really quite understand the pathogenicity or how COVID works and how we would treat COVID uh, and the initial thoughts was like we just need as many ventilators as possible um, but over the two to three months, and because of a, a shared platform with many groups uh, looking at their experiences from New York right through to Korea, through to China, uh, we begin to understand more and more how we can actually manage the process. So it's estimated that for if everybody in Ireland gets COVID, about 0.6% of people will die, uh, which is probably about uh, 30,000 people. So although we have flattened the curve, it's all about mitigation. These are the measures that we're putting in place at a government level, but it's not elimination. 
So we have to be mindful that, yes, we have flattened the curve and well done to everyone for, for holding their own and uh, supporting these measures. Uh, but the reality is, is that the curve will extend out over a period of 12, 18 months, maybe longer. Mm -hmm. And if everybody in Ireland gets COVID, that will e equate to about 30,000 deaths. And to put it into context, you asked me earlier, Roland, about flu. Flu is about 0.04% risk. So COVID has a, a 12-fold uh, increase in risk of mortality for people. Right. So it, it, it's quite impressive. Mm -hmm. uh, and so as we ease these lockdown restrictions, I think it's very important for the economy. Uh, it's very important so that within healthcare we can deal with non-COVID related risks and mortality. Um, we have to accept that we're going to be living with COVID for the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. And how can we as employers um, or as healthcare professionals, how can we keep people safe? We have a responsibility to keeping people safe. safe. Uh, and we have a responsibility, I think, to um, uh, support people through this journey, both from a physical and mental health well-being aspects that will be coming in because people's way of life has changed so drastically. And the pressures and stresses are actually quite similar, yet quite different. And how do we cope with that? And, you know, as an employer, I think we have some responsibility to implement coping strategies for our employees mm -hmm. so that we can live with the virus. Now, the hope is that we will get a vaccination through. And I know there's been uh, quite a bit of work done out of Oxford and Queensland. And there's a hope and speculation that we might even have something before the end of the year. Uh, but, you know, when vaccines are approved, they have to go into production and then you're talking about vaccinating the entire planet. And we don't quite know yet with vaccinations how many people will mount a good immune response and how many people will mount a sustained immune response. Uh, and so it's a learning curve. And so even with vaccination, we won't, it won't be the winning ticket. It's not going to be black and white. And so we, we just have to accept that we're going to be living with COVID, um, whether it's the current strain or whether strains may mutate over time. And so some reassurance I would say to employers if they're investing a little bit of money now into how they run their service or run their company, I think it's a worthwhile investment. I don't think it's something that you're doing for four to six weeks and then it's gone. It's forgotten about. Yeah. 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 So, and I, I suppose that's it. Like many employers are, they're keen to, to get back open uh, because, well, they know if they don't, their business may not, may not survive. And there, there are investments that have to be made to, to get there. Last, just last week, we were hearing on, on the webinar, the extraordinary measures that, that some of the manufacturing businesses that our alumni are running, uh, are putting in place to, to, um, to be able to go back safely and from your experience are there are there some measures that are more important than others that should be prioritised um, or how would you, um, you have any thoughts on that? Who run businesses um, or are in the both of the businesses you're trying to run your business you know and you know part of the NSAI guidelines would be that you should have a COVID coordinator in fact you probably should have too in case somebody goes out say uh, and that should be their business, is to manage your business, because you're going to be so busy trying to um, bring back work in and bring back funds and, you know, get the economy going again. It's, 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 it's hard to give it the focus that it needs. So I would urge people who own business out there, whether they're small or big, is to have a designated COVID coordinator. Right. And it's, it's their role to look at public health guidance and up-to-date recommendations and to put it into context to that particular business about what you should do. Um, and the most important thing is recognising that if you are bringing employees back to work, you should be giving them 72 hours notice. Um, you should be implementing questionnaires for all your employees. Um, and the questionnaire can be based on, you know, symptoms of COVID or the questionnaire can be based on other 
concerns. You know, if you if you want to take more of a holistic approach to how you manage your employees, mm -hmm. is it about their own health or is it a family member's health or is it childcare or is it financial? Is it IT support? There's a whole range of stuff out there that yep. that um, employees may want to be in a position to tell you. And, and it's important that employees have panels of communication open so that they can discuss their individual needs. Um, so with that in mind, then education is, is key. And so you will need to show that every employee has gone through this induction process uh, where they have been educated and that the documentation is there. And you need to recognize that if people are coming into your work uh, environment, that there is a logbook, a contact logbook, so that um, if somebody was to notify you that they are ill or they've been confirmed COVID or they've been linked to somebody with confirmed COVID, that you've got the contact logbook um, that you can make available to public health advisors. Uh, and that, that is a, a requirement of every employer out there. So the education side of it, I myself, I've set up a screening business and I'm, I'm looking at that about employees understanding what is COVID, you know? Um, we've had such a, a, a wealth of information coming at us that sometimes we miss the key points when we're looking at the finer detail. Yeah. And there's a very good video on the WHO website, for example, where you can, you know, it's a very uh, graphic, uh, you know, a video with a lot of graphics to explain to you how, how COVID had evolved. Uh, and I think that's key is what is COVID? And then what are the symptoms and signs of COVID? People need to know the symptoms and signs uh, properly and little small things like saying to uh, your employees you know if you're not feeling that well you know don't take necessarily take paracetamol which often people will do to get through their day yeah. wait and see whether you get a temperature because obviously paracetamol will mask a temperature and will allow you to go to work okay. and even when people have COVID I don't think temperature checks are going to be um, sufficient enough because you have ups and downs with, with viral surges into your blood, you know, a firemia as we call it. And when you have a firemia, you get a temperature. And when you don't, it settles down. So people with COVID can sometimes have temperatures and sometimes they don't. They go up and down. It's not like you've got a persistent temperature all the time. So right. um, little sim simple measures like that about the signs and the, and the symptoms. And then with the education side of it, I, I, I would put it down as, you know, people talk about these four or five pillars um, and uh, you need to look at hand washing, physical distancing, surfaces, masks, and, and maybe the culture around how you, you process that. So education is key. So for me, if I look at my own, just bring it up here myself around it, I've asked for a questionnaire. Um, I've asked that uh, people are compliant with the health and safety regulations and I've given them links. I've talked about, you know, people who work with you versus clients who come in, whether they come alone, you know, social distancing measures are put in place. Mm -hmm. um, how you wash your hands. Professor Cormican from the uh, HSC does a very good video about how to wash your hands properly. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a very good um, video from Professor Cormican from HSC about how to wear a mask properly. If, if you, as an employer, want to implement the policy that people should wear masks, mm -hmm. Um, it's probably useful as part of that induction process that you show people how to wash their hands properly and people how to wear a mask properly. Um, and what's your, and I, your views just, uh, just to, on masks and the, the value of them, like looking forward, I suppose, over the next X number of months, we don't know how, how long that'll be. Hmm. Is it something you would you'd lean on the side of recommending going for it? Well, I would wear a mask out outside in supermarkets, pharmacies, uh, in work, I've always worn a mask. And um, people would say that the, the usefulness of a mask is that you don't give it to somebody. Now, in fairness, as a healthcare worker, I would have been slightly more paranoid that I might give it to somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I have a duty of care in that regard. But, uh, you know, recognising that a lot of clusters come from healthcare workers, I think there were 300 confirmed COVID cases in the matter alone, uh, which led to about 1,500 people out um, self-isolating. So in fairness, one COVID case in your business can shut you down for two weeks if you're not yeah. careful about how you mix people, 
how you work out your, your working shifts, how you work out where people eat, uh, canteens, all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's, you just don't want suddenly to have what happened in the intensive care facility in Cork in the initial phases of, of COVID where they sent out 40 ITU employees because there was one undiagnosed COVID patient in the ICU yeah. and that nearly shut them down. Yeah. So, um, so masks to me, um, if you look at some of the data coming through, for example, Australia recently, there was a survey coming out of Australia showing that it significantly reduced transmission within the community if people were to wear masks. Now there's a surgical face mask, uh, where it talks about the type of particle sizes that can get through. And then you've got the cotton face mask. And you know, a good solid cotton will probably have be as, about 70% as effective as a surgical face mask. Okay. And it can be reusable. So um, it's, it's, it's nearly impossible to social distance in, in a lot of places. Mm. Um, but I would say this is where I come back to the five pillars of how people um, deliver on, on, on education. When you talk about face masks, you might show people a poster showing if I have it and you don't, well, then, and if I wear a mask and you don't wear a mask, there's probably maybe a 1.5 to 3% chance I'll give it to you. But if you wear a mask, it's, it's, it's right down. Okay. But if I don't wear a mask, there's up to a 70% chance that I could give it to you if we do not keep the two metre distance. Okay. And even the two metre distance is under speculation. Is it six feet? Is it eight? Is it 10? Is it 12? Uh, a bit of it may depend on, you know, you, you don't have the luxury in your office to have negative pressure systems where you have a turnover in the ventilation system of, you know, yeah. So you, you know, it, it depends on your work environment and you've got to ex understand that the risk will be there. So well, I, a much I greater chance, much greater chance with everyone wearing masks and there being no question about it than it being left up to if you are more comfortable wearing a mask or not. I, I would think that you should have as part of your policy, uh, recognizing that if, if some people have an issue with it, you know, um, you know, as Minister Harris talked about allergies, or there's all you know people have some kind of um, autism or whatever, where they, they if they're very upset about the prospect of wearing a mask, that maybe they could talk to the COVID coordinator, and that is a direct channel there for people mm -hmm. who can chat. Okay. Um, I did wonder at one point it would be a great opportunity for somebody to to develop masks that were see through. Because, yes. Yeah. I mean, very clever is, idea. Yeah. You know, there is a lot about um, uh, facial expressions and how people relate to each yeah. other. Uh, yeah. And so that it's, that's, it's harder than to, to work as a group, but realistically, we're kind of working apart, working together, you know, at the moment. So yeah. over this time. And the, good. The, the masks versus the, the screens that go down over your face. Yeah, well, the screens won't be as good around, you know, the different particle sizes, but certainly that might be your decision within your company to mm -hmm to try that because that's within, that is within, uh, that's within the um, regulations with public health policy, you might decide to go with one above the other. Yeah. Certainly something is better than, than nothing. I will say as well, if, if like when I go into the supermarket and I'm queuing for an hour and 15 minutes getting into Tesco or whatever, um, I'm, I'm really shocked about the number of people who don't wear masks. Yeah. Uh, so in Ireland, it's culturally, I think it would be very difficult to uh, create um, a willingness for people to wear masks. Uh, and so as an employer, you probably need to register that, like how do you get people to wear them and wear them correctly? Mm -hmm. um, and there's a bit about, you know, compliance. How do you deal with employers, um, employers with employees being compliant? And there's a bit about, you know, key performance indicators around managing COVID within your organization. So perhaps I would that if you to go down this route of uh, encouraging employees to wear a mask, that maybe the best way to, to manage that is to have performance indicators in place, as opposed right. to taking individuals out one by one, you know? 
Yeah. Um, if they are wearing masks and they're suitable, that if you've got somebody who does develop COVID within your organisation, and for example, they share an office that's two metres apart with good ventilation systems in place, the other person in the office may not have to go out and self-isolate. Which would be a big advantage. Mm. I think there's a big advantage to that. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what happened with me in work. I always wore a mask. In fairness, it was a, a surgical grade mask, but colleagues of mine were, you know, disrespect dropping like flies at one point, you know, developing COVID. But I could continue to work and I could continue to deliver the service that I needed to deliver. Yeah. Because when I was in their uh, vicinity and dealing with them and talking to them, I wore a mask at the time time okay okay well that's so it empowers you to stay working and to be productive and to be productive yeah which is and, it, and to wear it for an extended length of time i mean I've, i'm hearing different stories about that that it, it can actually be quite quite uh, uncomfortable and so it it can, would employers need to you, take that into account or yeah i think so and, and i think that's where you, you you know there's a very good checklist uh, from the HSE, which everybody should go on to, um, you know, around how to implement changes within basically every room in your organisation. Um, but a part of, of the numbers of people would be maybe shifts, as I said to you before, similar to fiestas in Spain, yes. maybe, maybe you should have two working shifts, one starting early at 7 a.m. going on till 1 or 2 and one starting at 3 going on till 8 or 9 o'clock at night. And I, I think a lot of employees would, would love that option, especially if they have children uh, to yeah. deal with during the day uh, and they've lost their, 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 their help. Um, uh, but also I think they would be grateful to think that they're going into a work environment where there's less people. Because you've you've implemented something that makes them feel more safe, so they feel that you care, you know. Care. Yeah, it's, yeah, which is important. So you could um, do split working shifts, and um, the biggest thing is when people need to eat. That's what I found myself. Mm -hmm. I could wear a mask all the time, all day. I I I no I no problems with that. But when you want a cup of coffee, you know mm. the old caffeine surge, and <laughs> um, you need to eat. Yeah. So that's where things get a little bit more difficult. So do you, you know, previously people would, you know, eat ad hoc or work on at their PC when they're eating or, yeah. Yeah. you know, it, it's a bit random, isn't it? And so um, I think you, you probably need to put in like these 15 minute breaks and say to people, right, your mask is coming off. This is your break. Uh, your break is outside. We can provide free coffee or tea or cappuccino for you. Yeah. Bring your lunch to work, you know. Um, uh, if you don't have any outdoor space for people to eat or the numbers are too too much and you, you need to use canteen facilities. I mean, some of the recommendations are saying that you need to take the desk, the tables and the chairs out of the canteen. But having said that, I've gone into quite a number of hospital institutions and the tables and chairs are all in the same place. And there are people eating and in theory, they're supposed to be two metres apart, but I'm, I'm not quite confident about that. So um, mm. a lot of these measures that people want to be to put in place, I'm not quite sure that we, are, we have the, you know, the equivalent of HICWA, you know, for COVID. I don't think we have people able to go in there and, and regulate that these measures are being implemented and, you know, how, how do we go about that? So it's back to the, to the leaders and the... The, the COVID coordinator, perhaps, should the COVID coordinator be somebody who's sitting around the management team for the next six months? I would, I would think so, for sure. Mm -hmm. And um, they have to be meticulous about things. Um, they have to have good people skills um, because they make to deal with um, employees who are anxious for whatever reason. And, and I think that's part of the initial, if you were to do a initial questionnaire or, or monkey survey, it could be anonymous for employees if you've got a large number of employees. Like, have you been affected by COVID? Have you had a loved one die from COVID? You know, uh, and as you said yourself, it's, it's quite a traumatic experience if I recently called one of the um, deputy HRs for one of the hospitals 
um, about advertising for junior doctors and a particular person was really upset over the phone because her dad had just died from COVID and he had been yeah. very well, had gone into hospital and no comorbidities, was there for two weeks, they never got to see him once. And so he died on his own. And then at the funeral arrangements, they had five people around the graveyard. You know, that was, they buried him effectively and that was it. So you've got to be mindful that some employees may have gone through that or they may have close family members who have gone through that. So they'll have been touched by it and they will be anxious about it. And then, well, as I said to you before, Ronan, as a surgeon, you know, you don't tend to get as anxious or stressed about things as my adrenals are probably raisins at this point. But, you know, when you see pictures of children with this inflammatory condition that people get from COVID, it's called Kawasaki disease, uh, tubed in Cronin, you know, you begin to appreciate that some mothers will start getting anxious about their children mixing with other children and bringing COVID into the, into the home and what does that mean? Or you may have people with, again, the HSC have a list of people who are very high risk versus the list of people who are just high risk versus the list of risk people who are just at risk. But at risk. Okay. actually, there's a lot of people out there who are in those two categories. One of my postgraduate students at the moment is, um, when I spoke to her, I suddenly realized she was cocooning because she's on a little bit of immunosuppression for colitis. So, um, it's it's actually it's it's there's a lot more people out there than we realize so how does a mother cope with a child who's got asthma on steroids what does that mean to her is that yeah. something that she's going to worry about yeah or is she going to be just okay and crack on with it and, and move along and your your employees when they go home they have to deal with their own anxieties and obviously you know providing for their families but they're going to have to deal with the anxieties of the people that they live with um, and maybe even their extended families. So as an employer, I think when you're dealing with employees, you should recognise that you're dealing with a family unit. Yeah. And when you educate employees, you're educating them to, who, and they in turn will educate people, uh, the immediate people in, in their family, which is actually quite important for the employer because they may not get COVID at work, they may get COVID in their home or from their neighbour or, yeah. or whatever. So by giving them um, an understanding of COVID and the signs and symptoms and how to, to prevent it, you're empowering them to keep COVID out of their home. And if they keep COVID out of their home, they'll keep COVID out of your office. Because in fact, your office may be nearly as good as a hospital at the end of this with the measures people are taking but but there are all sorts of other places out there that uh, that could uh, could be a, a risky place to pick it up mm. it's but, um, around, like the signage you need to put signage up in your in your work environment um, i noticed this recently i went past a clinic and i thought there's no signage i couldn't see any um alcohol dispenser beside the even beside the secretary dealing with those you know, patients, um, are you dealing with clients? And if you are, do you offer them a mask coming onto your premises or not? You know, um, I don't think the cost implications of that are, are too high if obviously the clients are, are spending money, you know. Um, so it's all, all of those things are important, you know, signage on the wall, signage on the floor, you've got your you know, you've got your screens up, you've got your alcohol, hand sanitizer, um, they've done their questionnaires before they come onto your premises. It's, it's, there's quite a bit of work involved and that would be down to the COVID coordinator to implement that. Just to, to jump in there with uh, Susanna Cawley, uh, solicitor in NACE has, has uh, asked a question there relevant to this, which was about guidance on prospect screens. And hmm. they have one in their reception what should they put them in their meeting rooms? Should they be giving their clients who are coming in and their staff masks to wear when they're having a meeting? Would you, uh, any thoughts on those ideas? Yeah, well, the thing is when your client comes to see you, you do not know their personal history. So you don't know if they're in the very high risk or the at risk category. Um, they also may not declare to you any issues they may have 
and it depends some people will be pretty complacent about covid and some people will be pretty hyper about it you know and um and in some ways they'll share that with you or they won't yeah. so uh you, there's so many unknowns when you're dealing with people personally my my preference is to start at the top and, and work your way down you know because yeah. um, you'll you'll regret not doing something as opposed to regretting doing something yeah. and and you like i i was in the garage the other day and i was asked to move from the queue to somewhere else and i passed somebody by and the person got quite irate with me because i came close to him because i was wearing a mask maybe he got a bit anxious or because he didn't want me close to him and you can get upset or about that but you can also say well maybe maybe his dad died of COVID. i don't know mm. you know he's right to get upset yeah so when people get a bit difficult with you in your office or in your environment um, how are you going to deal with that will they get difficult with you because they do not want to implement your policies about wearing a mask mm -hmm. or will they get difficult with you because they're you're not wearing a mask and they they want you to wear a mask you know so it is easier to explain to a client i think that actually i am trying to keep you safe and i'm trying to keep my employees safe so i am implementing these measures yeah it is harder to deal with a client who is upset because you, you your standards aren't quite similar to their standards should i say whether it has an impact or not it's how do you explain that to the client going well you want to wear a mask but we don't we don't wear masks on our premises so because yeah. we, we have we, we take we see things differently so um so i would i would put screens up in the area and if you're having meetings you need the meeting do you need that number of people at the meeting can you not fit your conference in to the meeting or have a zoom conference where there's no actual official location site if you need to deal with people on a one-to-one -one basis and you can't um you know people coming into the room um need to recognize at least that on your website that you have health and safety regulations in place uh, and that you would have liked them to have read some of it before they come in it's up to them whether they've read it or not uh, you know there's hand sanitizer available to them and here's a mask because i don't i cannot guarantee that you're going to be over two meters away from me. I cannot tell you how good my ventilation system is in my room, you know, for air exchanges. Uh, and so I am trying to keep myself safe, but I'm trying to keep you safe. We're both going to wear masks for the duration of this of this particular meeting. You're an important client to me. We're going to chat for the next whatever 45 minutes to an hour about about business. Well, that's that's very practical, Karen. If I if I could zoom out a little bit, because uh, this difference that you mentioned about people's perceptions, there are a lot of figures flying around. There are a lot of different opinions flying around. A lot of news about how to deal with this and how not to deal with it, and what works and what doesn't. Uh, some are making the case that applying the same high risk profile to every workplace is not necessary, uh, and that the the hunker in a bunker sort of approach uh, may even be counterproductive in in just extending the length of or the duration of the impact of all of this what uh, you you were alluding to it there in an earlier point about a sort of holistic approach to you know employer looking at employee and their family and and the wider impact on society how would you how would you sort of answer that that view that you know, that, that that's there that some people feel it's it's over uh over we're being overly cautious and perhaps harming um businesses in uh, in the short to medium term well uh, you know businesses are beginning to open so that's good um we recognize we're gonna have to live with covid mm -hmm. um as i said before you don't want one of your employees or a number of your employees anything over four is perceived to be a cluster uh to be recognized uh, as either having COVID or getting COVID on your on your premises uh, because it's a very bad thing for your business you know down to those um you know the the meat factories around around Ireland so you know you do not want 
you know people talk you don't you do not want people to to question why there has been a cluster cluster in your particular business um and the concern will be that you did not put enough public health and safety um measures in place and that you put your own your employees and your clients at risk so you you do not you do not want that perception to get out there about your business. So if you're just purely thinking about getting your business up off the ground and getting it running and being productive, you know, this is like the tax return for these people who don't like the side of, of life. You just yeah. gotta get on with it. You gotta do it. You gotta put the measures in place. And then you gotta hope for the best uh, that you're not going to be in, you know, impacted to any great extent. And if you're not, great. And whether the measures that have been put in place have been needed or not you're, you're never really going to know and you don't want to know you never want to be in that situation where you get caught so if you look at cambridge recently they screened all the healthcare workers in cambridge uh, recognizing that cambridge you know the doctors and nurses were kind of top of the list but three percent of the of the um health workers were positive and of the three percent 57 percent had no symptoms None at uh, all. None at all. None at all. Uh, and so I did circulate to you on at one point, I think it was something on the, I thought it was quite useful on the BBC website, where you could put in what you do for a living and see where you come around that level of risk. So I think dental nurses were number one, nurses were number two, doctors were number three. It was interesting, I think taxi men were quite high up there, for, ex for example. So how are taxi men going to run their businesses? Not just about at risk of getting COVID, but you know, if you get into a taxi, what's your risk of getting COVID? So if the taxi man wants to run an effective business going forward, he is going to be OCD about putting COVID measures in place because he, he wants to reassure his clients that they are safe, whether whether COVID is an issue or not. Very good. Yeah, well, it's it's certainly worth looking at that. Uh, and, and I suppose that raises a question, is there a bit of a, a spectrum there where if, if you're in an organization where you've applied a lot of these good measures and sensible measures and you, you're, um, you're at low, let's say, lower end of the risk of, of, uh, of actually transmitting or picking it up, should they fire ahead and, and, uh, and keep... Uh, keep sort of growing and expanding and getting back to work as quickly as can and getting as many back and so forth. I would, I would think so. Mm. Um, you know, you've formalized the whole process, you've done the documentation, you've had your induction, you, you basically get on with it. And yeah. the, key, the other thing then is to, if somebody gets COVID, how are you going to, to manage that? Uh, down to, you need to have a room that's, on its own that can be seen to be an isolation facility mm -hmm. and you need to have some level of PPE available for your cleaner or your cleaning contractors and I, I suppose you need to, to look at who your cleaner is or your cleaning contractors and what measures are they putting in place for cleaning surfaces or if you're going to do adjunct kind of um, cleaning options such as I don't know as we mentioned before UV room sanitizers but um, I think if um, if somebody like gets the one COVID, that John Gehan was uh, was sharing exactly. with us there, that's, yeah. That's, yeah, that's very cost effective, you know. Yeah. Um, I would think uh, the key thing for me, I felt, I said to John, it'd be nice to put it into the room for eight and a half minutes before the cleaner goes in to clean the room and do a deep clean, because actually you're keeping the cleaner safe, cleaning the room, you know, as well as cleaning the room and keeping your employees safe. But even if you were to use it for um, high traffic areas such as bathrooms, uh, kitchens, those type of areas, it would be it would be useful. But um, if somebody gets COVID, you know, when do people who've had COVID return to work? And at the moment, the public health guidance is if you have 14 days and onset of symptoms and you're five days symptom free, you can go back to work. Mm -hmm. I'm a bit reluctant to think that that's quite enough. I think if people come back having had COVID, you've got to look at their working um, arrangements and you should probably encourage them to wear a mask. 
So there are a number of people out there that still seem to have positive nasopharyngeal swabs having recovered from COVID. And the testing for COVID using nasopharyngeal swabs, it's testing the virus, whether the virus is alive or dead. So there's speculation that when you're doing the tests after the 14 days and you pick up COVID, is, are they just shedding dead virus? Not a reinfection. It's, it's, you know, so that they're not actually infectious. Um, so you just have to be a bit mindful about people coming back to work. And I, I think the immunity tests will be really important here. Uh, because with the immunity tests, and there are quite a number of options out there, you'll get a pinprick point of care test with a result back in about five or 10 minutes. Wow. And they look at your immunoglobulins, which is your IgM and your IgG. And if you have IgG, uh, you've had COVID uh, and you've nearly recovered or have recovered. If you have IgM, that's usually um, immunoglobulins that develop in the bloodstream in the early stages of the COVID infection. So there's a chance that you may be still infectious. Okay. So I think if somebody has had COVID and they go back to work, it would be useful to obviously go through the whole induction process with them again. Um, you've done all your contact tracing because you've, you've given the direct contact log back to the, the public health advisors. Um, you know, you um, and when they're coming in, it might be useful to do an immunity test on them. Now, at the moment, they're not saying what, they're not saying how you interpret immunity tests, but certainly if you have no IgM and you have IgG, um, then it's reasonable to think that maybe you're no longer infectious. Right. And it probably adds a little bit of reassurance to you as an employer that it's reasonable to have this particular employee back on the premise. Back. So in I the, to... Sorry. Pardon me? In New York... It's... Thank you, Ronan. In New York, in Mount Sinai, they, they checked out 1,500 people who had COVID. And what was reassuring to me was that they all got antibodies. So even people with mild COVID got antibodies. So, and that these antibodies seem to be able to neutralize the virus. So, um, and that they're actually using the blood or the plasma from people, they call a convalescent plasma, to give to people who have COVID to try and treat them like passive immunity it's called. But what I, I liked was that, you know, we now know that the uh, immunity tests seem to uh, reflect that people have had COVID, because sometimes people don't know, uh, and that most people, even with mild symptoms, seem to be developing immunoglobulins. So that's reassuring. So for people out there who think that they may have had COVID, but they never got tested, because those all those a lot of disorganization at the beginning and the people who are getting tested or getting results back, you might want to get a point of care immunity test and just um, check to see if you have immunoglobulin G to COVID because then you know you've had it. And I think there, you know, we can't be definite about it, but there may be some understanding that you have some level of immunity to, to, to the disease. We might know that for a while, I suppose. That this is it's a constant evolving knowledge coming out on, on this. There's a lot of testing being done, a lot of a lot um, of testing being done. And I yeah. think initially they, they were saying they're false negatives, false positives, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. People weren't sure whether the tests were, were were accurate. But the Abbott test, for example, is showing conclusively that it's ninety-nine percent so um I would think that there's reputable bits out there and if you don't have IgM or IgG you haven't had it so unfortunately I'm sorry ladies and gentlemen that was influenza or something else that you had at the time mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, but it also maybe makes people less complacent because they think oh I've probably had it I think I probably, sure yeah. had it. Um, I checked myself straight away because I bought a kit and um, uh, I haven't had it so oh. I was disgusted because my husband had come back from China in December and I was really unwell. And in my head, I was convinced I'd had it. I had it. And you hadn't. Uh, so, and it's still it's ahead of you. Still ahead of me. And sometimes it's useful information to have. 
and it maybe makes you less complacent, you know? Um, so I think that knowledge is power and I, that that may be useful. And then the other thing is if people are coming back to work after having COVID, maybe it reassures them that they do have immunoglobulins, but also it's more reassuring, reassuring to the employer that they don't have IgM immunoglobulins, which would suggest that they're in a persistent infectious phase. Right. Uh, for some reason, some people seem to stay, I think, infectious for more than 14 days. Uh, and maybe it's a small percentage of the population, but nonetheless, I would certainly would like a test and a wear a mask. Because they could, they could spread it to quite a lot of people very quickly otherwise. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, if maybe I could shift the discussion just before we go to, to some questions, uh, Karen, but um, to the wider sort of health implications for leaders, uh, many have used this lockdown and the slowdown to, to take stock and, and maybe can reconsider how they're living their lives and maybe the, the futility of constant activity towards some future goal at the expense of living well today or living in the present now. It's the uh, disorder rather than we've all got it. It's which? It's a personality disorder. We've all got it. That's, we've that's all got it. it. <laughs> I think there's, there's a touch of that. But, and, and I suppose the, the life of a leader in that sense, you know, it's not ideal. You mentioned it earlier. There were like combination of stress, uh, maybe without adequate recovery, poor diet, um, maybe too much drink, uh, poor sleep patterns, lack of exercise, weight challenges. Is there an opportunity here, do you think, for a step change in, in attitudes on that? Uh, first of all, for leaders themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, I think health and well-being is really important and um, I was such before, and I went to face that it was so incredibly busy, and I was trying to slow down, almost just to collect your own thoughts, mm -hmm. because you know you know that you're too busy when you're dealing with people, but you're not in the moment. You're thinking about the next thing ahead of you, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and so your your brain becomes a schedule, you know, and you're you're slotting things into your schedule and you're trying to find space in your schedule and that's never a good place to be. But I spoke to my husband about this and um, he said, funny enough, with the pandemic, you've been trying to slow down a little bit for years, but um, you struggled because the people around you were still running at 150 mile pace. Like this is the first time and the only time in a lifetime where you've had to slow down, but you might have been able to slow down because everybody else had slowed down around you, you know, yes. kind of like, you know, you can get on the train and you want to get a slow train in, but the train's not even going. And of course, previously, just, it was just, you know, run, 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 run. So, um, and I'm sure some people are probably thinking, oh God, it's eight weeks now or nine weeks. God, it's flown by to some extent. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so it's 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 a useful time to self-reflect about your health and well-being. Can you do things differently uh, to give you back time? Uh, are there things that you do that you never really need to do? And now that you've stopped doing it, it doesn't need to be done. That will give you back time. How valuable are are some of the tasks that you've put into your into your life or into your calendar? Um, maybe you've exchanged it for other more meaningful exchanges, whether it's with children or family or, you know, next to kin. Um, uh, Health-wise, certainly uh, for me, I would always try to put time in my life for exercise, but never quite got there, Ronan, because I'd have to schedule it in. Yeah. And my, my idea of exercise is going to the gym and scheduling an hour, an hour and a half. Yeah. Whereas now I've suddenly realized, so I walk out my door, I can go for a run for 30 or 45 minutes. It doesn't necessarily need to be scheduled. So you suddenly realize how um, useful it can be or how productive you can be when you do things in an unscheduled way, ad hoc, off the cuff, to be able to do something like that. So, um, and eating well, um, I would say that we have to be careful uh, because with the queues into the supermarkets being so so long that you don't want to suddenly start going towards the takeout options as the easy option every time. Mm -hmm. um, 
And then, you know, anxiety or concerns or well-being, you, you, I think most people out there will probably say that they've had more communication or conversations with people in their lives um, because they've given them their time and they've, give, they've, had, they've received time back. So how you talk to people, how you communicate, how you chat. It'd be lovely to bring a little bit of that environment back into the workplace if you're trying to be holistic about how you manage your employee, uh, down to, for example, your breaks. So um, if you're having a break, you know, maybe because there's no canteen facilities now, do you extend people's breaks without extending their day where the expectation is that you have to go outside? There's nowhere to hang out inside. So, you know, do you offer them, you know, certain type of walks? that they could do in the environment of the office or a run? Or do you put facilities outside if you have the luxury of an outdoor space? Um, and definitely with the, we've been quite good within the matter um, because we've had weekly updates uh, from the CEO and part of the updates was obviously informing us about how things are going, but it would have been a list of other things that were available or on offer to people uh, down to a certain I'm doing the nine o'clock Joe Wick session exercise session online it's been streamed in with my kids because you know through my employer they said to me you know these are online facilities that you know that are free that are accessible that you can use for you and your family because if you spend the right time with your family your family feels safe and well and are happy you're safe and well and you're happy you're better to work in the working environment, you're more productive in the working environment. So they've been right. quite good about not just dealing with the individual, but maybe treating the family unit and focusing on health and well-being. Yeah. Very good. Well, that's, that's very, very helpful uh, advice. We, we'll go to some, uh, some questions, live questions from, uh, from the attendees. Uh, I'll say if, if anyone else would like to uh, ask a question, ask put it in the Q&A box, but we'll... We'll have uh, Peter Flanagan, I think, from uh, Flanagan Kearns has a question uh, for you. Hi, Peter. Hello, hello, Karen. Very sobering, very cogent, and very to the point, very useful. Thank you very much for that so far. Uh, just from the point of view of motivation, and from the point of view, we'll all have members of the team that, let's say, are a little bit more anxious than others. Have you had any experience of that at work and how to allay fears, how to motivate them, how to say, you know, from the point of view, we'll get through this, we're in this together, as a team we can fight this. Any, any, any successful uh, schemes or incidences of that? Well, the first thing I did was when the whole thing started, is I set up a couple of different WhatsApp groups. I set up one which is an education one uh, for my junior doctors. And um, that was quite useful to start with because in some ways it gave them knowledge. And I think with knowledge, it gives you, it gives you power, you know? Um, I think it's very important that the COVID coordinator for your group um, reassures your employees that you're taking this thing very seriously and um, that, the, that you're being um, overly cautious about implementing the right measures, uh, which could be from, you know, the distancing within your workplace, shifts at work, uh, masks, whatever. Um, the anxiety side of it will change depending on individ individual influences. And I think people have to have the opportunity to talk through that. So it could be that, but I remember the first day I did a COVID positive case, um, the porter, that particular operating theatre got really upset. And he unfortunately lives with an elderly parent who is unwell, you know? Yes. And he did not want to go home to his mother who would be unwell. So how, you know, and, and for instance, this is with COVID-positive disease, you, you know, so it's probably a little bit more extreme, but 
how do you um, help people through that? And I, I think you have to step by step move people through the process so that they understand the process and that they feel safe at every step of the way and that will empower them. So, you know, that's where the education uh, in a kind of formalised induction for all employees, so you're not picking out one employee versus another, will be important. You know, down to if you're going to self-monitor, you know, this is the questionnaire, you need to ask yourself this every day. Uh, this is how you do a temperature check. This is how, you, you know, are you going to offer them temperature checks at work or are you going to ask them to do it at home? Are you going to supply them with a thermometer? A lot of people don't have electronic thermometers at home. In fact, we ran out of them. Um, to stay safe at home, there are some guidelines around vitamin D, uh, vitamin C with zinc, um, um, some people use Pepsid, you know, some people would make some other observations about it. Um, and obviously then if you do have a problem, we are, you know, whether it's on-site or off-site, we are going to support you through that. It was very difficult for employees or for people in general at the very beginning where they couldn't contact their GP. They couldn't get a response. They wanted a swab, but they couldn't get, they couldn't get in to get a swab. Certainly, I have a brother with Down syndrome, and he was three weeks waiting on his swab results. You know, and I was trying to work out how do I deal with that. So, in, in some ways, as we go back to work, and this is partly the reason why it's been a staged process, uh, and the government are trying to put measures in place, like how do we screen people um, uh, effectively, quickly, so that they know what's going on. Uh, what do we say to them if there's a risk, you know, around isolation, coming in and out of work? What are we doing in work to protect? Them? So it's it's um, there's there's a lot of there's a there's a lot of thought that has to go into it for individual businesses, and you, you really have to put a little bit of time and energy into this. And I, I would really um, encourage people to invest in it at this point in time. And if you've got somebody who has is a good project manager with good people skills. They don't have to have a medical background, but maybe they could lean towards somebody, you know, that, that can help them process the information coming through or, you know, formalise a contractor or a health and safety public officer of some kind. You know, if you, that person is key to your organisation to help your employees through it. And then everything is so COVID, 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 COVID. I do feel that some of the communications that you have with your employees could be non-COVID which is what I, I liked about the, the emails that were shared with us um, as healthcare workers, you know, you know, they'd be recommending a cookery class online, you know, or um, there, there might be some kind of session where people might be able to contribute, or there was, I know somebody at one point uh, shared a link, as we all have on some of these WhatsApp groups that would cheer us up. There was a man out of, I forgot it, the community out of Port Marnock in Dublin, he was out singing his opera with all, all the all the neighbours listening in and it was lovely. So, or, you know, some, some people, I know one, one person from her own ALP group uh, shared Beethoven's Fifth. Ooh. And I, I, I have to say, I really enjoy that and I listen to that every day going to work. Lovely, lovely. Well, Karen, we're getting, getting towards the end, but there is one last question from a, a uh, one of your fellow participants in the Advanced Leadership Program, Louis Davis is asking Hi, uh, the question of, um, it's written one here, and he's not live. Has your experience with the Timony Program had an impact on your approach during this pandemic? So I thought, uh, briefly throw that one at you. <laughs> Thanks, Louis. <laughs> hope you're well, hope the kids are well. Uh, yeah, no, it, it, absolutely. Um, the, it's, for, it's the content of the, of the course. Um, it's the people who I did the course with and shared experiences with. I've made some great friends. Um, I don't I have to say during these troubled times feel alone, uh, which I think is very important uh, that you have the wealth of individuals around you that we have met through the Timony groups that have, I would say, a, um, a similar outlook uh, on life. And, uh, you know, a problem shared is a problem halved. 
Uh, and what I liked most about the, the group sessions that we used to have, maybe six, eight, ten people in a group, was recognising that everybody had a different perspective on things. And as, as a good leader, I think you need to try to see how different people or employees will have a different perspective on things, uh, you know, respect that, and then support them through this process of what is effectively a pandemic, you know? Great. Well, thank you uh, very much, Karen, for that and for taking the time this afternoon as well to share your, your uh, vast experience there and thoughts on, on how to approach getting back uh, to work safely over the, the coming weeks and months. And I'm sure everyone understands that, you know, we don't have all the answers at this point. And these webinars are really here principally to help you grapple with the uncertainty and, and hopefully make better decisions in, in a reasonable way with, with the information that we, we have at hand. But uh, thank you, Karen, for, for, that, um, for that session. We'll be back next week and uh, we look forward to your feedback in the meantime. If you did miss any of our earlier webinars and you'd like to to go back over them, they're on our YouTube channel. And we'll also be sharing them as a audio podcast on SoundCloud uh, as well, in case you, you want to, to listen to them that way or to share them with other leaders who, who might like to listen to them as they, the weed, the garden or, or, uh, or whatever. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much and stay safe, stay the course and, uh, and have a great week.